I'm sure many of you know the story of the city mouse and the country mouse, both of whom had learned how to thrive and survive in their own environs, but neither of whom had a clue what to do when dropped in the other's world. Most of us in this room, we're city mice. And I'm sure that unless you grew up in a much more rural environment, you're not quite sure what to do with some of what we heard today. We might not naturally resonate with these pastoral settings we hear about in today's lessons. All this talk about <coughs> shepherds and sheep, it seems so remote, so romantic, so antiquated. This imagery works if you're a country mouse naturally attuned to the power and beauty and wisdom we gain from the natural world. But if the only lamb you've seen in your life has been stretched out across your Easter dinner table with a side of green beans surrounding it, you can be forgiven for yawning a little when you hear these readings. Wake me when John has something to say that I can make sense out of. John has Jesus say, not only am I the good shepherd, but I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Have you ever wondered what Jesus meant when he said that? Or what John meant when he wrote it? Often when I've heard this passage discussed, the other sheep are identified as later followers of Jesus. Members of the community John was a member of long after Jesus' resurrection. Or, some theologians suggest that we might hear it as referring to those of other faith traditions, devout, faithful, religious practitioners who would, in an encounter with Christ, recognize Jesus as a divine figure, even without ever having heard his name before. In much the same vein, we often quote Jesus saying, in my Father's house there are many rooms. In both of these passages, John seems to be trying to broaden the hearer's worldview, to offer a universal message of salvation for all people, all cultures, and all races. This seems to be a likely explanation of what we're invited to take away from the message of the other sheep who do not belong to this fold. None of these ideas are exclusive of one another. The authors of scripture, including Jesus, painted for us this lovely idyllic scene of Jesus in a meadow, surrounded by his beloved creatures, buying and bleeding and adoring him. The psalmist imagined green pastures and still waters and treacherous shadowy valleys. They all knew and appreciated the inextricable bond between the spiritual world and the natural world. When they needed to understand the nature of God, they looked to the natural world, to the rest of God's creatures, whose presence articulated the awesome, profound, imminent, and transcendent nature of the creator they worshipped. Jesus 
over and over again uses natural examples to show us the majesty and the beauty of God. The God who loves the whole of creation. Today I'd like to add one more layer to that pastoral landscape of Jesus with his sheep. Maybe, just maybe, in this age, in 2024, we are losing our ability to wonder at God's creation, to perceive the link between creator and creature. Perhaps we have shut our hearts to the needs of all those divinely formed creatures, animate and inanimate, urban and rural, rich and poor, first world and developing world, flora and fauna, land creatures and sea creatures, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. Perhaps part of why we were all so profoundly moved by the solar eclipse, because it was this tiny moment when we could get it again, when we could see the power of the divine illustrated in our natural world. What if all of those, all of them, are Jesus' sheep? What if John and Paul and the other epistles had it right when they proclaimed that Jesus came to save not just humanity, but the world? What if they, thousands of years ago, understood in their own way that the world needed saving? Consider that our neighbors in need, our human neighbors across the globe, neighbors in Sudan, Ukraine, in Russia, in Taiwan, in Israel, and Gaza, and all those places where suffering and pain abide. But consider that perhaps our neighbors also are coral reefs and icebergs, tigers and polar bears, spotted owls and condors, glaciers and oceans and rivers, dogwoods and balsam firs and bristle comb pines. What if these two are God's sheep? What if our celebration of Earth Day tomorrow is really meant to be a celebration of all of the earth and the entire cosmos' profound participation in the divine. Then perhaps saving ourselves and saving our planet are the same work. And Jesus came to help us see and know that. Perhaps the love and compassion we are meant to offer in imitation of Christ is meant to be given to all of creation. How might that kind of spiritual insight change our vision, our priorities, our day-to-day -day lives? Jesus laid down his life for us, for all of us. 
and Jesus invites us to do the same for one another. To lay it down so that we might take it up again. Tomorrow is Earth Day. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. Somewhere on the earth tomorrow there will be green pastures with sheep, sheep grazing safely. There will be wolves birthing their pups. There will be whales breaching and dolphins playing, spiders building webs and termites swarming. There will be tides coming in and seashells being thrown ashore. There will be fires blazing, rivers running dry, pesticides flowing into the water table, and even still cherry trees blossoming. There will be births and deaths, hunger and thirst, plenty and starvation. And Christ will be there in the midst of it all, beckoning us to see, to comprehend, and to care. To care. To see and care for his sheep. Christ will be there beckoning us to lay down our lives of trivial pursuits and mindless consumption so that we can take up our lives as sibling and caregivers for the whole of creation. As creatures created in the image of God, we have the capacity to love the world with all our hearts. We have built in DNA a primal calling to care for the young, the fragile, and the vulnerable and help build a world full of possibility, of hope, and promise for all those who come after us. We are the sheep of Christ's pasture, a pasture jam-packed with defenseless little lambs. Who will defend them if we don't? Who will protect them if we don't? Today, tomorrow, the day after, what might we do to follow Jesus, to listen to the frightened calls of his sheep, and to lay down our lives for those fragile lambs?